Well, hi guys, it's Corinna from Shared Legacy Farms and MyDigitalFarmer.com. And today I am talking to all of you who are thinking about starting a CSA from scratch. One of the most common questions that I get from farmers is, what do I do if I'm starting at zero? How do I go about marketing and branding and getting people to join my CSA? So that is what today's session is all about. And I started my CSA back in 2008. Oh my gosh, that seems like a long time ago. And the way that I did things back then is not necessarily how I would do it today. Most of it's the same, but there were some tools that just weren't available to the extent that they are now um, that I would definitely add into my docket if I were starting over again. So today's training is going to be sharing um, kind of my experience, what I recommend, but also I'm gonna be throwing in some things that I think are important from today's world, some of our digital tools that are out there that can help you so that you can really get some awesome ideas here if you're just starting your CSA. Now, I also wanna mention that I asked this question inside my private Facebook group for um, CSA marketing discussion, and I got a, a lot of really, really great responses from some of my colleagues and farmer friends. They said, hey, this is what we did when we started our CSA. And I am going to try to reference some of those answers in today's training as well, so that you're not just hearing from me, but you're hearing from other people who have done this well as well. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna get started, take some notes. And if you are a rookie to CSA, this I think is gonna be really, really helpful for you. So number one, I guess this is for me probably the most important tip, is I recommend that you start small, okay? And that you focus on caring about the relationship with your customers. There's a reason I titled this, this talk and this video, your first 10 CSA customers. I didn't say your first 50. There's a reason that I did that because I really, really believe that you need to start at a small number. I think we started with 12 people our very first year, and I'm so glad that we did it that way. Here's the thing, when you're just getting started out with CSA, it's, it's a totally different way of growing because you have to have so much variety and you have to make sure that you've got things in the pipeline and that you have enough stuff to put into their share every week. And we made mistakes our first year. We had gaps in the production line that were quite frankly awkward for us as farmers. And if we didn't have people in our tribe, those first 12 people that um, had been prepared for that, who really knew us and who were forgiving, I think things could have gone really badly and we would have lost people the second year around. So the people that we ended up attracting and recruiting into this team were really into us. They believed in us and they wanted us to succeed, even if that meant that they didn't get their full investment. And I think that that was a really key reason why we ultimately made it through that first year. Um, we were very one-on-one -on -one with our clients. We knew them by name. I can still picture who they are, the Sobels, the Eaglesham's, um, Coyle, Stamos, the Bakers, the Hoffmans. Um, I, I mean, I remember who they are and we still have one of those customers with us 11 years later. Um, but we knew them intimately and we talked with them at Pickup and we shared our lives together. And I think that value add was really, really important to them. And it kind of gave, that, gave them grace when we messed up. They were much more willing to be forgiving. They wanted us to succeed, they were behind us. So caring about the relationship and starting small. If you have too many people, when you make mistakes, because you will, you will not be able to kind of make up for it. You won't be able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, if you've got 50 people that you've got to handle. It's just not gonna be the same experience for them. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that we should not have started our CSA from scratch um, with zero experience. Now, my husband comes from a long line of vegetable growers, but we had never grown for a CSA. We had just, he had just done like tomatoes and sugar beets and peppers with his parents growing up. And so this was all just kind of an experiment. And looking back now, I would say you should not do it that way. If you have not ever grown for like a farmer's market, or a roadside stand or some other outlet, don't just make your first experience as a farmer be a CSA. It can be tempting because you see the cash flow, right? You see all that investment up front. 
don't do it. Take the time to, to get, the, get the ropes down, learn how to farm and how to grow for a year or two. And that also helps you build up kind of a clientele. Katie Bishop's in our group and she echoed the same sentiment. She said that they started with 30 members and she said, honestly, we didn't have enough farming experience to start a CSA after only our first year farming. I wish we had started smaller with exclusively people we knew before farming, like friends or family, or had waited another year to become better growers. Um, I heard that several times in some of the comments. So really take that to heart. Start small and focus on the relationship. Number two, um, leverage connections that you already have and build your base from there. So I kind of uh, started talking about this in the last tip. Um, we began our business um, kind of launching off of Bench Farms, which was my, my husband's parents. They are an established farm family in this community, and they have been one of the oldest founding members of the Perrysburg Farmers Market, um, and they're a greenhouse grower, and people know my mother-in-law, and they love her. She's an amazing woman, and they shop her stand. And so when she kind of announced to her tribe, my son is coming back with his new wife and he's starting an operation, an organic operation, and they're gonna do a CSA. Um, she had people in her group that were shopping from her who were you know, long time members of her farm, of, of her business, suddenly say, oh my gosh, I wanna support him, that sounds amazing. So she, it was almost like we got a testimonial from a very credible source and those best of the best people and customers were willing to take a risk on us. And I'm not sure if it would have been as easy if we hadn't had that. So we had a launching pad to jump off of. We had connections through our, my mother-in-law. She was able to find some of those really great customers. So that's why I say if you have the ability to farm and then you know, sell your stuff at a farmer's market, build relationships with people there, your best customers are then the people that you can pitch the CSA to and they will be much more likely to try it out. You can even give them um, somewhat of a discount the first year um, or you kind of style the CSA in a different way. Maybe it's more of a market style, whatever you want, but there's some ways that you can, you can kind of minimize the risk in those first years. Um, so many other CSA farmers in our group also recommended having a farmer's market stand beforehand or a roadside stand or a, you know, a store on your site and recruit from those core customers. Barbara Gosnell said, folks who consistently shopped with us at the farmer's market were our first CSA customers. So I would also recommend that you look at family members, friends, neighbors, coworkers, um, anybody that you know. Uh, if, you're, if you volunteer somewhere at your church, um, tap into those people, let them know what you're doing because those, again, are people that want you to succeed, right? And they're willing to take a loss because they, they want to do whatever it takes to help you get better at your craft. So use them as guinea kid pigs and they kind of become your first fan following. Um, this allows you to get some experience in your growing as well and you'll get the kinks out because there will be some kinks, you guys. There's a lot to CSA. It's not just growing produce which a lot of first time farmers, CSA farmers don't know going into it. It is a lot of customer service. If you want them to stick around, you've got to, you know, do some palm pressing and you've got to take some time with them. You've got to teach them how to use this food. You've got to listen, make adjustments, and you've got to treat them like your best customers, like your priority customers. So many people don't do that. They give them the leftovers or like secondhand and first they take care of their farmer's market people. You guys, it's the other way around. It's gotta be flipped. You've gotta see your CSA members as your insiders, as your you know, top of the line people who get the best stuff. And so they take, it, it's, it's work. You have to take care of them. So there will be kinks as you work through that new system. Um, Christine Wise is in our group and she actually wrote physical letters. She said our first year we had six CSA members. Do you see that? Another small CSA. And we wrote a personal letter to about 20 families that we knew from homeschooling and the staff from a nature center where we had volunteered regularly. So they were all people who knew us personally and who knew how serious we were with being in this for the long haul. Okay. So you see how she also leveraged her connections and relationships that she already had. People that understood her, who got what she, you know, probably had similar values. So um, take that to heart. That was another really common piece of wisdom that came from other experienced CSA farmers. Okay, number three, 
In general, you are going to use a grassroots strategy, all right? You are going to be speaking, connecting with people everywhere you can in your first year. I do not recommend a, a digital marketing strategy when you are just getting started out. You need to start building that for you know year two and three as part of your strategy, but you're primarily gonna find your first people the old fashioned way by getting to know people and talking to them, actually talking to them. What an amazing concept, right? So um, you're gonna be pounding the pavement. My husband told me when we were going through this last night, he's like, Akurna, you gotta pay your dues. And I'm, that's kind of how I look at it. When you're getting started, there is no fast track shortcut to finding your first customers. You've got to work for it. Sarah Mahan, I hope I'm saying that right, I loved what she said because she just encapsulated it. She said, you have to go out into the community, meeting people, shaking hands, making eye contact. This was before we had a table in a market and we were just starting out. We got a personal connection and we got to tell our story. People love that. It's time intensive, but it works, especially in the beginning, she writes. We went to, to, to the Chamber of Commerce events. We went to potlucks in the area, community events, educational talks. Yes, 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 yes. Sarah has her, has it down. She has it down. This is exactly what you have to do. So what you need to do is look for examples and opportunities to speak to groups wherever you can. Now, Brie Bacon is also a farmer in our group and she recommended a long list of places that you could show up. Some of them are gonna be in this list that I'm about to go through. Um, so this is kind of a, a combination of many farmers ideas and also some of the things that we did. Okay, so Rotary Clubs. Okay, this is gonna take time, guys. It's gonna be like maybe possibly 10 to 15 meetings. Okay, get ready, here we go. Rotary Clubs, library groups, go and say, hey, can I do a talk at your library? Gardening clubs, find them. Ask them if you can give a talk. Health fairs, find out where they are. Somebody will maybe eventually start calling you and asking if you wanna go. Um, town community events. I know we have the Portage River Festival. We have all kinds of events in the little town of Elmore, believe it or not. Get a booth, show up there. Apple Festival, we have something called the Apple Festival out in Oak Harbor. We got a booth for that one year. The Walleye Festival is out in um, um, Port Clinton. We were there. Coffee shops, um, set up coffee shop talks, post it on your Facebook page and just go there and try and get people to show up and talk about it. Master Gardener groups, the slow food movement. If you have one in your town, find out who that is and get in touch with them. See if you can meet some of those people. There are really influential people that come to those dinners, okay? Um, herb sales, seed swaps, have a booth. Country, go to the country club. People with money are at the country club. So find where people with money hang out. Um, the Kiwanis Club, Earth Day fairs, um, any kind of fundraiser, raffle basket, nonprofit thing. You guys get ready to give away a few you know, weeks, weeks worth of shares. Uh, to like five or six places. What this does, it just gets your name out there. And Brie also said that it helps if you're doing several of these back to back so they complement each other. So when you're just kind of doing a big push and you're in a lot of places, all once people start seeing your name and, and your face in a lot of different places because some of these people will be in multiple, multiple locations. Laurel Blomquist, Laurel, I think I'm butchering your last name, um, but she said, we showed up to local events that were highlighting food as medicine or healthy living, sometimes as a vendor, sometimes just as a participant with brochures in hand. These people didn't always join, but I love this, but they talked about you later and built awareness. So don't just come out of those you know, experiences where you've met with people. I know this has been true for us. We go and do this big talk to master gardeners and we get one person, right? or nobody, you might get nobody, but here's the thing, you are talking about your brand and your new product to key influencers in your space, okay? These are your people. These types of groups that I just went through have people that value what you value, who know people who value what you value. They know your customer avatar. And so if you get in front of these eyes and talk about it, it just builds awareness and eventually um, the harvest, so to speak, comes, right? You'll see the reaping of your uh, rewards there. So expect to do most of your recruiting in this early stage one-to-one -one in person or on the phone. Like I do a lot of phone calls in the first few years. I was on the phone talking to leads and trying to explain what we did. And I often closed a sale because I took you know 15 minutes to explain it. Um, so again, I would not focus on trying to get my first 10 members using the digital marketing methods. 
Um, you really need to build that relationship and you need to establish credibility. People don't know who you are yet. They don't have that awareness. They haven't gone through that awareness and engagement phase and stage with you. So they don't know, like, or trust you yet. You have to build that first. That's why that one-on-one -on -one relationship is so important. So tell your story. Number four. Now I did not do this, but if I were starting over today, I would definitely have this as a major part of my strategy because I think it's brilliant. Um, join some kind of foodie Facebook group. Okay. They exist. Find the ones in your area or maybe find your, like uh, every community probably has a Facebook group, like Elmore has the talk of Elmore and the talk of Woodville. So I'm in those groups and that's where everyone's talking about what's going on in our own town. Um, so join the foodie Facebook groups where your customer avatar hangs out. Get in there. Now here's the trick. You don't want to go in there and start promoting right away. You want to be a part of the community, add value, give advice, you know, just be a part of the community like everyone else. And then from time to time, mention your product, okay? Or do a poll or ask a question or do something that helps you figure out if people are interested in it. And it will establish you as an expert in that particular space or, you know, as the purveyor of a particular product. Sharon Mozzie um, reiterated this in one of her comments in the group. She said, I was part of a local foodies Facebook group. I posted asking if a farm were to have a meat CSA, what types of meats would they like as foodies? What would they be interested in? Would anyone be interested at all? And she got like, I forget what she said. I should have written that down. Like 30 people were like, oh my gosh. I totally want, when you're ready, let me know. And so, you know, she was able to kind of get her first list of prospects from that group. Um, okay, number five, website. Website, website, website. So in 2008, I think we had a website. It was really lame. It was just kind of at the beginning of websites that were kind of easy, not even. I don't even wanna say it was easy for a normal average person to get into the website field and make their own. So I didn't have a great website. Um, I would definitely, definitely say you need to have a website if you want to get started as a farm business, um, and that your CSA needs to be somewhere on that website. Here's the thing. So many, not everybody, but so many people today really do shop online first. So when they find out about you often before they're willing to plunk down a big chunk of change, they're going to go and do research. It's part of the, the buying process. And if you don't have a website, um, or if you don't have a Facebook page, so you should have one or the other, ideally both. If you don't have either, then you don't look credible. People are going to be like, are they for real? So having a website page or having a Facebook page kind of shows that you, you're the real deal. You actually do exist. This isn't just you trying to get money from them. Okay. So, um, you also, I think need to really consider having a way for people to pay online. I actually, we have a square store that we use for other things. We don't use it for our CSA yet, but I think we're probably moving that direction um, because most of your people will, will purchase your CSA by clicking on a button, not necessarily filling out a form, a paper form nowadays. So you need, you need to have some kind of a, a, a website where people can do that. Um, Carrie Ann in our group said it's very important to make it easy for people to sign up. We accepted a few forms of payment right away, accepting credit cards, through your website is absolutely one of the best things we decided to do. So there, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. We're still resisting because we're just holding on to that. I don't want to give you those fees. That's several thousand dollars. But I have a feeling that we would probably sell out uh, faster if we did um, offer credit card payment. I don't know. You guys can weigh in. Let me know what you think. Bottom line is you need a website, even if it's just very, very simple one page, um, something that proves that you are a real business. Number six, um, a Facebook page uh, or an Instagram account, something, uh, one of the two big cornerstone social media platforms. And I consider those to kind of be the two big ones right now. Um, again, this can serve, if you don't have a website, this can serve as the place that people are sent to to find out about your farm and see that you're a legitimate business. Um, I did not obviously have this in 2008. I don't even know, was Facebook around then? It was probably just getting started. I don't know. Um, but I didn't really jump onto the Facebook train for many years after that. Uh, but I definitely feel like it's something that you need to do. Even if you don't have a ton of uh, followers right away, create one. Rose Byzance said um, that 20 of her memberships she got from Facebook posts, word of mouth and posters, 
Facebook was huge for communicating with people initially. So Facebook is a powerful platform because it's where you can do your visual storytelling. It's where you can post pictures, tell people what's going on behind the scenes, jump in for a Facebook Live, shout out quick um, announcements, give recipes, and just begin the process of branding your farm, getting people to become aware that you exist and start to engage with you. So I think that's really where its real value comes is in the bot, uh, excuse me, the top of the marketing funnel, as we call it, where people first enter and then they slowly move down to buying. Um, so Facebook page or Instagram are great places for people to see what you're all about. Um, plus you need face a Facebook business page to run Facebook ads. I don't know if you know that, but you do. Okay. Number seven, word of mouth. You guys are going to rely on word of mouth and you need to leverage word of mouth big time. So we actually asked as people would begin to join and we, you know, we would recruit and we would get another one and we're like, yes, we got one. Um, then we would ask those people, who else do you know that might like this? Okay. Now, because these people were so into trying to help us succeed as young farmers, like we were, we were at the time like 30, when did I get married? Like 30, 32, 33 years old. And we just had a brand new cute little baby. I mean, we were like the attractive character in a brand, right? Everyone wants us to succeed and be that cute farming couple. And so we would just ask them, who do you know that would probably like this that we can talk to? And they gave us leads. They gave us people that we could reach out to. And so um, that is definitely something that you should, you should leverage. Uh, your own customers will be your brand ambassadors over time. But at the beginning, you can actually ask them too, because in many cases, they want to be a part of this process of building your business. Um, and they have those connections with foodie friends. I remember we actually went to a party at someone's house. They hosted a party. I felt like I was going to a candle party or a pampered chef party. I mean, that's kind of how it felt. They had food and they brought they invited like four couples to come and hear our CSA pitch. And we did, and we signed two of two of them there. So um, Bridget Zerker said, "My this is another farmer from our group. My very first year, I trialed three families. They all worked with my husband and were very good about giving good feedback to build my confidence for the next year. It was great to try only three people to get an idea of what I needed to plant and when. The second year, my customers came all from word of mouth and Facebook posts. So again, word of mouth is really huge. If they have a good experience, they will talk you up the next year as well. So once year two hits, that's when you want to start collecting testimonials and you're going to use those testimonials to help sell your product. Testimonials is one of the social proof is one of the four reasons that people actually finally decide to buy. So when you have people that vouch for you and say this worked, that kind of check marks a box in their mind. Okay. So, um, as year two hit, we got our next 12 customers. Um, I think solely just from recommendations from other members. And, uh, so it was pretty easy to double the next year. Um, Vicki Fryman said, use testimonials, collect them and do them as posts on social media, which is a great idea. So once you get a testimonial from someone, use it as a post, turn it into an ad on Facebook. Those are really, really powerful. Okay. Next tip is get some print brochures made, uh, make some actual flyers. Okay. So remember I said, I don't recommend focusing on digital marketing in your first 10 for your first 10 customers. You're going to have to pound the payment. And that means you're going to need to have something to give to people. So take a little bit of time and design something, um, on canva.com. For instance, if you don't know how about Canva, it's a free graphic design tool. And I did a video all about that. I'll link it later on in the video. Um, but take, take the time to make a decent looking brochure. Don't crowd it with too much information. Oh my gosh. Don't confuse people. Keep it simple. Don't burn their brain cells. Okay. Um, but put some pictures on there of pretty produce. Okay. Good pictures, not just like bad pictures. You know what I mean? Um, take the time to have a beautiful picture and a kind of a quick dissection of what you're going to get in the box and what you're going to get every week. All right. You're going to put those flyers and brochures in a few different places. Here we go. So I recommend that you place flyers and posters around local businesses. So we went around to some of the high end restaurants where we knew our customers 
were and we were beginning to develop relationships with those chefs anyway and they let us leave those brochures there on their table and because they were nicely made they kind of fit their brand it wasn't like i was giving them a cheap piece of paper that didn't look good in their classy place right and so they left it there um, we put stuff up uh, at, in our library in health food stores um, the post office in in town anywhere where I could find a cork board. And I mean, I remember I had those big vanilla, manila envelopes. And then I, you know, wrote, wrote on them. I had something on the front, like, please take one. And then I had like somehow taped the actual brochure above the flap there. And then I had stuffed it with a whole bunch of brochures. And I would go like every week and a half and I'd have to replenish it. They were getting taken in the post office, especially. I'm in a local rural town where the post office is like where everyone hangs out. So um, just don't, I know that sounds really like, you know, small town and low key, but like that worked. So don't discount those methods. Um, we also, uh, one year we took our local flyer and we actually used every door direct mail um, and had some decent results with that. It was pretty expensive. I don't know if I would do it again just because it was a ton of work getting that all organized and learning how to do it. I know Lori Weiss has done that before too in our group with really great results. Um, we've also done it where we just stick it, we give it to our local newspaper and they, we pay them and they stuff it into the local paper and it goes out every Friday. Um, we got some good results from that and that was a lot cheaper. Um, Laurel, again, from our group said, since we're focusing on hyper local members, so they have a farm that's like inside of this sort of special community and they're the community's farm. And so they're really trying to just be that community's farm. So they went door to door, I love this, with a bag of sunflower seeds a letter explaining who we are and our business cards to 250 to 300 of our neighbors. So I don't know if you're allowed to canvas your neighborhood like that or if there's laws against doing it in certain places, but um, that is another, another great idea, just coming up with a creative way to get noticed. And I think they had like a sunflower farm in the middle of their community, so that kind of fit the fact they were giving sunflower seeds. And then these brochures, you can also have them ready to go and pass them out at the farmer's market where people are picking up their boxes or if you have a farmer's market stand wherever you have something already you should have these out and you should be promoting it to people anytime they buy something stick it in their bag talk about it just mention it um, so that's a really big one you do need to have some some kind of print materials and you don't have to get fancy if you just want to make a bunch of like postcard size things on vista print or um, even business cards are really cheap you can get a bunch of those made and it can be, you know, just like a coupon that looks like a on a business card size business card. Um, I've done that before that just has my, you know, contact information or where they can subscribe. Okay, number nine, I recommend that you make one of your pickup sites for your CSA at the farmer's market or in, you know, some kind of a prominent location where there's foot traffic, where your avatar is hanging out, your, your ideal customer is hanging out. The farmer's market, we still only go to one of them. We used to go to two. We finally dropped the Perrysburg one, um, but we still go to the Toledo market. We don't make a lot of money there. I, I don't know if that's the case for many of you, but we see the value of the Toledo farmer's market as a lead generator. It is a place where our people hang out and see us every week and know that we exist and people find out about our CSA from there. Now, I want you to imagine we have some really cool looking boxes. We spend some money on our, on our plastic totes with um, our sticker on the front and, and they're pretty. And so, and then some people get a fruit share, which you know stacked on top of that. I want you to imagine somebody, a customer of yours, picking up a box like that and putting it in their wagon or whatever and walking through the market, you know, as they continue to shop, uh, that particular box is a piece of advertising. It's, it's everyone, I know we had people who, were, who would stop these customers because they would tell us and they would say, hey, who, where'd you get that box from? What's this all about? Um, and they would come and find us and ask about it. Plus, you know, when we have a booth at the farmer's market and we've got 30 boxes, you know, behind us that are stacked on top of each other, nobody else has that. And it makes people pause and stop at your table and say, what is going on back there? Like, what is that wall of boxes? And then it becomes a, a talking point, a talk trigger for you. So uh, it makes people curious and it's, it's an easy conversation starter. Um, Laura Hairgro Lara Hairgrove Miller in our group said, I collected email addresses while at the farmer's market 
for folks that wanted to sign up for our farm's weekly newsletter. And then I marketed the CSA in our newsletter in the winter and spring. So I love you, Laura, you're after my heart. So I am a huge fan of collecting email addresses, as you know. So if you um, have a way when you're at that farmer's market, make sure that you're, when people are showing interest, get their email address. They're not gonna sign up for the box right there and then, guys, it's never happened to me, ever but they will, they're starting to think about it. And now there's no way for you to follow up if you don't have their contact information. So at the very least, get their email address. If you don't have time to write a drip campaign and you know, subscribe them to it, that's fine, but you can at least email them later and ask them, hey, can I call you and talk to you about my CSA, okay? All right, I recommend though, trying to just put them on your weekly email and just do your weekly email. They'll start to get to know you, you'll give away good information, you'll brand yourself as an expert in your space, and you'll slowly warm them up. For us, it takes about 14 months to warm up someone from start to finish before they convert. I just want you to know that, that's a big number, um, but I'm willing to do that, so that's why I have all these mechanisms in place that allow a person to slowly warm up. Okay, number 10, this is a really big one. Um, we did not do this, but it has been done to us, and it's brilliant. Leverage joint venture partnerships or JV partners. So find other products that complement yours and contact them. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. Weber Ranch uh, is a meat CSA in, in our area and they came into the area probably ooh, maybe five or six years ago, six years ago. And they reached out to us from Montana when they knew that they were coming back and they said, hey, uh, we're just wondering if we could meet with you. And they began to build a relationship with us. They're now really good friends of ours. And over the course of that relationship, they eventually came in for the ask and said, hey, would you, would you let us promote our meat to your customers? Now this is super smart because if I were coming to start a new business in an area, I'm gonna try to find the people that would buy my product. And I know that the people who would buy my product are probably people in a CSA in a vegetable CSA, so it's brilliant. If you can find a, a, you know, another farmer who already has the list, who has your customers, and you can somehow do a partnership with them, tag onto them, it is a great way for you to pretty much get a ton of customers fast. Now, we're already having this happen again to us. There's a local dairy um, that has reached out to us, and they want to add milk now to, uh, to our share and just be like a drop-off site, like once a month show up to our sites and have milk for people who might have signed up for milk. And we're actually really thinking about it. We don't have that yet. We would get a small kickback from it. And, and I'm gonna you know, build that relationship farther, further with this dairy farmer. But hey, that's really smart. They're about to get access to 400 plus people who are foodies who would go crazy and love this. So if you are someone in that position um, and you have kind of a supplement product that could tag onto a vegetable CSA, reach out to some of those farmers and see if you can form a partnership with them. It's a great way to fastly build your business because essentially Weber Ranch got our list. They got our customer list in like really short time. Okay, number 11 um, is find a way into your local newspapers. Um, I put this at the end because uh, I, I feel like newspapers are not as huge a media as they once were, but there are still people that read them, especially kind of specialty newspapers. So we have like a parenting paper in Perrysburg that all the moms, you know, the young moms in, in their late early 30s get. Um, the, there's something called the Toledo City paper, the Buzz, the Press is our local town's paper. Um, so I wouldn't recommend paying for an ad in a paper. I don't think that works. But um, if you can develop relationships with them, um, try to get them to, to do some kind of an article on you, uh, definitely call your local food editor and make them aware that you exist. Take the time to take them out to lunch or something. We actually did that with our local food editor, Mary. And uh, don't forget the power of press releases. And you can Google how to write a press release and it'll give you like the basic format and template that you need to use, it's not very hard. Um, and I would not just do like, hey, I'm trying to sell my CSA. Don't write a press release like that. You wanna create some kind of uh, newsworthy event and write about that so that people see you as a, you know, a cool farm that's doing something. So we've gotten done press releases for field to table dinners. We did something called Farm Science Camp a few years ago and we had some people come out and say, that's really cool. And so then they learned about our farm. So I didn't talk about my CSA, 
but my farm got on the paper, right? It got in there. And then from time to time, the food editor does do an article about CSAs in the area, and I get you know, brought into that discussion. Um, I'm also gonna bring up localharvest.org here. It's not a newspaper, but I didn't know where to tag it on. You should definitely put an entry onto localharvest.org about your farm. You're gonna get probably two or three members a year from that, but um, put it out there because it's free and it might even be worth it. I know we pay the, the annual fee to, to get our a star next to our name and bump us to the top of the list. I actually have to do that. I haven't done that yet. Um, so that is kind of, those are the big strokes of what I would recommend doing. Um, bottom line is these first 10 customers, you want to give those customers outstanding service. You want to treat them like kings. You want them to know that they are your priority this year. And so you're going to have to not just give them a great box of produce, but come up with some brainstorm, some other ways that you can uh, appreciate them and care about them, be checking in with them, asking how things are going. That will really reap great rewards for you. All right, that's all I got today. Like this, give me a thumbs up, some kind of emoji, whatever you feel inspired to do right now, if you found this even remotely helpful. Um, and I would love if you would share in the comments of this video uh, what maybe you have done in the past and I also want to recommend that you go and find my Facebook group. It's called CSA Marketing Discussion, and you will find a ton of ideas in the post for this video as well. Now, if you are looking for kind of a short list of the, the top 10 marketing assets, channels, whatever that you should be developing in your first few years, I want to give you what I think are the kind of the the priorities. You can get that at sharedlegacyfarms.com forward slash 10 things the number 10, 10, one, zero things. Type that in, it's gonna ask you to subscribe. And you'll get, uh, I think it's a one or two page document that just lists, hey, these are the things that you should start working on first um, for kind of year two and three, as you begin to build more, scale up and you need to build some more digital marketing tools. Um, but Publicity Flyer is one of the 10 things that is on there, so is website, so is Facebook page. So you'll kind of get an idea of where you should begin if you're just getting started. That's all I got. If you liked this, again, give me a thumbs up. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, please subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate it. And throw me a comment down below. Take care, have a good week, and we will see you next time. Bye guys.